Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series in Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with the final proper chapter of the book, chapter 26, entitled The Lesson After 30 Years. I did mention briefly that this is the final proper chapter of the book because there is one roughly two-page read after that that is just simply a note on books. Uh, It's his recommendations of further reading Um, So I'm actually going to do that on this channel, so stay tuned for that. But this will conclude the the actual content of Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson. As I mentioned throughout the course of this series, uh, we are doing this uh, series as a parallel read with Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies, which we wrapped up. So I'll put a link in this video description so you can check that out as well. As I've also mentioned throughout the course of this series, we'll be doing an analysis and review at the end of each read. So we'll put a timestamp in this video description so you can jump straight to the analysis and review part of the video if that's how you'd like to go about things. <clears throat> So with all that out of the way, let's get in, let's dive into tonight's final read, which is chapter 26, The Lesson After 30 Years. The first edition of this book appeared in 1946. It is now, as I write this, 32 years later. How much of this lesson expounded in the previous pages has been learned in this period? If we are referring to the politicians, to all those responsible for formulating and imposing government policies, practically none of it has been learned. On the contrary, the policies analyzed in the preceding chapters are far more deeply established and widespread, not only in the United States, but in practically every country in the world, than they were when when this book first appeared. We may take as the outstanding example, inflation. This is not only a policy imposed for its own sake, but an inevitable result of most of the other interventionist policies. It stands today as the universal symbol of government intervention everywhere. The 1946 edition explained the consequences of inflation, but the inflation then was comparatively mild. True, though federal government expenditures in 1926 had been less than $3 billion and there was a surplus, By fiscal year 1946, expenditures had risen to $55 billion, and there was a deficit of $16 billion. Yet in fiscal year 1947, with the war ended, expenditures fell to $35 billion, and there was an actual surplus of nearly $4 billion. By fiscal year 1978, however, expenditures had soared to $451 billion, and the deficit to $49 billion. All this has been accompanied by an enormous increase in the stock of money. From $113 billion of demand deposits, plus currency outside of banks in 1947, to $357 billion in August 1978. In other words, the active money supply has been more than tripled in the period. <clears throat> the effect of this increase on, in money has been a dramatic increase in prices. The Consumer Price Index in 1946 stood at 58.5. In September 1978, it was 199.3. Prices, in short, more than tripled. The policy of inflation, as I have said, is partly imposed for its own sake. <clears throat> more than 40 years after the publication of John Maynard Keynes's General Theory, and more than 20 years after that book has been thoroughly discredited by, anal- by analysis and experience, a great number of our politicians are still unceasingly recommending more deficit spending in order to cure or reduce existing unemployment. An appalling irony is that they are making these recommendations when the federal government has already been running a deficit for 41 out of the last 48 years, and when that deficit has been reaching dimensions of $50 billion a year. <clears throat> An even greater irony is that, not satisfied with following such disastrous policies at home, our officials have been scolding other countries, notably Germany and Japan, for not following these quote-unquote expansionary policies themselves. This reminds one of nothing so much as Aesop's fox, who, when he had lost his tail, urged all his fellow foxes to cut off theirs. One of the worst results of the retention of the Keynesian myths 
is that it not only promotes greater and greater inflation, but that it, but that it systematically diverts attention from the real causes of our unemployment, such as excessive union wage rates, minimum wage laws, excessive and prolonged unemployment insurance, and overgenerous relief payments. But the inflation, though in part often deliberate, is today mainly the consequence of other government economic interventions. It is the consequence, in brief, of the redistributive state, of all the policies of expropriating money from Peter in order to lavish it on Paul. This process would be easier to trace, and its ruinous effects easier to expose, if it were all done in some single measure, like the guaranteed annual income actually proposed and seriously considered by committees of Congress in the early 1970s. This was a proposed tax still more ruthlessly on excuse me, this was a proposal to tax still more ruthlessly all incomes above average and turn the proceeds over to all those living below a so-called minimum poverty line in order to guarantee them an income, whether they were willing to work or not, quote, to enable them to live with dignity, end quote. It would be hard to imagine a plan more clear more clearly calculated to discourage work and production and eventually to impoverish everybody. But instead of passing any such single measure and bringing on ruin in, in, in a single swoop, our government has preferred to enact a hundred laws that affect such a redistribution on a partial and selective basis. These measures may miss some needy groups entirely, but on the other hand, they may shower upon other groups a dozen different varieties of benefits, subsidies, and other handouts. These include, to give a random list, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, food stamps, benef veterans benefits, farm subsidies, subsidized housing, rent subsidies, school lunches, public employment on make-work jobs, aid to families with dependent children, and direct relief of all kinds, including aid to the aged, the blind, and the disabled. The federal government has established that under these last categories, it has been handing federal aid benefits to more than 4 million people, not to count what the states and cities are doing. One author has recently counted and examined no fewer than 44 welfare programs. Government expenditures for these in, in 1976 totaled $187 billion. The combined average growth of these programs between 1971 and 1976 was 25% a year, two and a half times the rate of growth of estimated gross national product for the same period. Projected expenditures for 1979 are more than $250 billion. Coincident with the extraordinary growth of these welfare expenditures has been the development of a quote-unquote national welfare industry, now composed of 5 million public and private workers distributing payments and services to 50 million beneficiaries. Nearly every other Western country has been administering a similar assortment of aid programs, though sometimes a more integrated and less haphazard collection. And in order to do this, they have been resorting to more and more draconian taxation. We need merely point to Great Britain as one example. Its government has been taxing personal income from work, quote-unquote earned income, up to 83%, and personal income from investment, quote-unquote unearned income, up to 98%. Should it be surprising that it has discouraged work and investment and so profoundly discouraged production and employment? There is no more certain way to deter employment than to harass and penalize employers. There is no more certain way to keep wages low than to destroy every incentive to invest in new and more efficient machines and equipment. But this is becoming more and more the policy of governments everywhere. Yet this draconian taxation has not brought revenues to keep pace with ever more reckless government spending and schemes for redistributing wealth. The result has been to bring chronic and growing government budget deficits, and therefore chronic and mounting inflation in nearly every country in the world. For the last 30 years or so, Citibank of New York has been keeping a record of this inflation over 10-year periods. 
Its calculations are based on the cost of living estimates published by the individual governments themselves. In its economic letter of October 1977, it published a survey of inflation in 50 countries. These figures show that in 1976, for example, the West German mark, with the best record, had lost 35% of its purchasing power over the preceding 10 years, that the Swiss franc had lost 40%, the American dollar 43%, the French franc 50%, the, the Japanese yen 57%, the Swedish krona 47%, the Italian lira 56%, and the British pound 61%. When we get to Latin America, the Brazilian Cruzeiro had lost 89% of its value, and the Uruguayan, Chilean, and Argentine pesos more than 99%. Though when compared with the record of a year or two before, the overall record of world currency depreciations was more moderate, the American dollar in 1977 was depreciating at an annual rate of 6%, the French franc of 8.6%, the Japanese yen of 9.1%, the Swedish krona of 9.5%, the British pound of 14.5%, the Italian lira of 15.7%, and the Spanish peseta at an annual rate of 17.5%. As, as for Latin American experience, the Brazilian currency unit in 1977 was depreciating at an annual rate of 30.8%, the Uruguayan of 35.5%, the Chilean of 53.9%, and the Argentinian of 65.7%. I leave it to the reader to picture the chaos that these rates of depreciation of money were producing in the economies of these countries and the suffering in the lives of millions of their inhabitants. As I have pointed out, these inflations, themselves caught the cause of so much human misery, were in turn in large part the consequence of other policies of government economic intervention. Practically all these interventions unintentionally illustrate and underline the basic lesson of this book. All were enacted on the assumption that they would confer some immediate benefit on some special group. Those who enacted them fail to take heed of their secondary consequences, fail to consider what their effect would be in the long run on all groups. <clears throat> in sum, so far as the politicians are concerned, the lesson that this book tried to instill more than 30 years ago does not seem to have been learned anywhere. If we go through the chapters of this book, Seri Seriatum, we find practically no form of government intervention deprecated in the first edition that is not still being pursued, usually with increased obstinacy. Governments everywhere are still trying to cure by public works the unemployment brought about by their own policies. They are imposing heavier and more expro expro exproprietary taxes than ever. Excuse me. Expropriatory taxes than ever. They still recommend credit expansion. Most of them still make, quote-unquote, full employment their overriding goal. They continue to impose import quotas and protective tariffs. They try to increase exports by depreciating their currencies even further. Farmers are still, quote-unquote, striking for, quote-unquote, parity prices. Governments still provide special encouragements to unprofitable industries. They still make efforts to, quote-unquote, stabilize special commodity prices. Governments, pushing up commodity prices by inflating their currencies, continue to blame the higher prices on private producers, sellers, and, quote-unquote, profiteers. They impose price ceilings on oil and natural gas to discourage new exploration precisely when it is in most need of encouragement, or resort to general price and wage fixing or, quote-unquote, monitoring. They continue rent control in the face of the obvious devastation that, has, that it has caused. They not only retain minimum wage laws, but keep increasing their level in face of the chronic unemployment they so clearly bring about. They continue to pass laws granting special privileges and immunities to labor unions to oblige workers to become members, 
to tolerate mass picketing and other forms of coercion, and to compel employers to, quote, bargain collectively in good faith, end quote, with such unions, i.e., to make at least some concessions to their demands. The intention of all these measures is to, quote-unquote, help labor. But the result is once more to create and prolong unemployment and to lower total wage payments compared with what they might have been. Most politicians continue to ignore the the necessity of profits to overestimate their average total or net amount, to denounce unusual profits anywhere, or to tax them excessively, and sometimes even to deplore the very existence of profits. The anti-capitalistic mentality seems more deeply embedded than ever. Whenever there is any slowdown in business, the politicians now see the main cause as quote-unquote insufficient consumer spending. At the same time that they encourage more consumer spending, they pile up further disincentives and penalties in the way of saving and investment. Their chief method of doing this today, as we have already seen, is to embark on or accelerate inflation. The result is that today, for the first time in history, no nation is on a metallic standard, and practically every nation is swindling its own people by printing a chronically depreciating paper currency. To to pile one more item on this heap, let us examine the recent tendency, not only in the United States, but abroad, for almost every quote-unquote social program once launched upon to get completely out of hand. We have already glanced at the overall picture, but let us now look more closely at one outstanding example, Social Security in the United States. The original Federal Social Security Act was passed in 1935. The theory behind it was that the greater part of the relief problem was that people did not save in their working years, and so, when they were too old to work, they found themselves without resources. This problem could be solved, it was thought, if they were compelled to insure themselves, with employers also compelled to contribute half the necessary premiums so that they would have a pension sufficient to retire on at age 65 or over. Social Security was to be entirely a self-financed insurance plan based on strict actuarial principles. A reserve fund was to be set up sufficient to meet future claims and payments as they fell due. It never worked out that way. The reserve fund existed mainly on paper. The government spent the Social Security tax receipts as they came in, either to meet its ordinary expenses or to pay out benefits. Since 1975, current benefit payments have exceeded the system's tax receipts. It also turned out that in practically every session, Congress found ways to increase the benefits paid, broaden the coverage, and to add new forms of quote-unquote social insurance. As one commentator pointed out in 1965, a few weeks after Medicare insurance was added, quote, Social Security sweeteners have been enacted in each of the past seven general election years, end quote. As inflation developed and progressed, Social Security benefits were increased not only in proportion, but much, but much more. The typical political ploy was to load up benefits in the present and push costs into the future. Yet that future always arrived, and each few years later, Congress would again have to increase payroll taxes levied on both workers and employers. Not only were the tax rates continuously increased, but there was a constant rise in the amount of salaries taxed. In the original 1935 bill, the salary tax is only the first $3,000. The early tax rates were very low. But between 1965 and 1977, for example, the Social Security tax shot up from 4.4% on the first $6,600 of earned income, levied on employer and employee alike, to a combined 11.7% on the first $16,500. Between 1960 and 1977, the total annual tax increased by 572%, or about 12% a year compounded. It is scheduled to go much higher. At the beginning of 1977, unfunded liabilities of the Social Security system 
were officially estimated at $4.1 trillion. No one can say today whether Social Security is really an insurance program or just a complicated and lopsided relief system. The bulk of the present benefit recipients are being assured that they quote-unquote earned and quote-unquote paid for their benefits. Yet no private insurance company could have afforded to pay existing benefit scales out of the quote-unquote premiums actually received. As of early 1978, when low-paid workers retire, their monthly benefits generally represent 60, about 60% of what they earned on the job. Middle-income workers received about 45%. For those with exceptionally high salaries, the ratio can fall to 5 or 10%. If Social Security is thought of as a relief system, however, it is a very strange one for those who have already been getting the highest salaries receive the highest dollar benefits. Yet Social Security today is sacrosanct. It is considered political suicide for any congressman to suggest cutting down or cutting back not only present but promised future benefits. The American Social Security system must stand today as a frightening symbol of the almost inevitable tendency of any national relief, redistribution, or quote-unquote insurance scheme, once established, to run completely out of control. In brief, the main problem we face today is not economic, but political. Sound economists are in substantial agreement concerning what ought to be done. Practically all government attempts to redistribute wealth and income tend to smother productive incentives and lead toward general impoverishment. It is the proper sphere of government to create and enforce a framework of law that prohibits force and fraud, but it must refrain from specific economic interventions. Government's main economic function is to encourage and preserve a free market. When Alexander the Great visited the philosopher Diogenes and asked whether he could do anything for him, Diogenes is said to have replied, quote, Yes, stand a little less between me and the sun. End quote. It is what every citizen is entitled to ask of his government. The outlook is dark, but it is not entirely without hope. Here and there one can detect a break in the clouds. More and more, people are becoming aware that government has nothing to give them without first taking it away from somebody else, or from themselves. Increased handouts to selected groups mean merely increased taxes, or increased deficits and increased inflation. And inflation, in the end, misdirects and disorganizes production. Even a few politicians are beginning to recognize this, and some of them are even stated clearly. In addition, there are marked signs of a shift in the intellectual winds of doctrine. Keynesians and New Dealers seem to be in a slow retreat. Conservatives, libertarians, and other offenders of free enterprise, other, excuse me, defenders of free enterprise, are becoming more outspoken and more articulate, and there are many more of them. Among the young, there is a rapid growth of a di disciplined school of Austrian economists. There is a real promise that public policy may be reversed before the damage from existing measures and trends has become irreparable. That concludes tonight's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So this is the chapter where, upon review, Hazlitt basically reveals that the entire purpose of this book is actually just a rebuke of Keynes. So... I, I understand what the lesson is that he's trying to teach. The purpose behind the lesson is revealed in this chapter to be just simply a rebuke of Keynes, which uh, we actually did do a review of Keynes' general theory on this channel. I'll put a link in this video's description to that so you can check that out. I didn't actually finish the book because it was so bad, um, but uh, do check that out. So we are so the rebuke that he's looking at is the Keynesian view of... Uh, a Keynesian monetary policy, which has become the accepted general monetar mon modern monetary theory, which is that money can just be printed indefinitely without consequence. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But the point of this uh, of this 
chapter, the main thesis of this chapter is actually a review of the last 30 years worth of economics in regards to his book and the lesson within it. Uh, and his review in summation is straight, pretty straightforward on page 207. In sum, so far as the politicians are concerned, the lesson that this book tried to instill more than 30 years ago does not seem to have been learned anywhere. So this chapter is basically just a major black pill until the last second. Um, and uh, it can be summarized as just 30 years later, the economically illiterate have only doubled down and made things worse. And honestly, my review of it today is that 40 years after that, nothing's changed. And I wish I could see the look on your face, Henry Hazlitt, if you, if you could time travel to the present day. Uh, and then cue the montage of Does This Sound Familiar? Page 205. Um, folks, Does This Sound Familiar? This was a proposed tax. This was a, a proposal to tax still more ruthlessly all incomes above average and turn the proceeds over to all those living below a so called minimum poverty line in order to guarantee them an income, whether they were willing to work or not. Quote, to enable them to live with dignity, end quote. And Hazlitt goes on to say, it would be hard to imagine a plan more clearly calculated to discourage work and production and eventually to impoverish everybody. And we call that the Green New Deal. I mean, this might as well be, I don't know if you guys have actually read the text of uh, AOC's proposed the Green New Deal, which was brought before the Senate floor for a vote and got no votes in favor of it um, as Democrats uh, decided to abstain from voting. Um, and voted present instead of either for or against. <clears throat> the, the, what I just read, that excerpt, might as well have been just a copy and paste of the Green New Deal. It's, again, when I say co copy and paste, I mean, this was the language that was in the Green New Deal, almost, almost verbatim. And then, of course, does this sound familiar? Virtually all of the grievances on pages 207 to page 209. I mean, I could I could pick anywhere. I could pick a grievance anywhere in the, in the bottom of page 208. Most politicians continue to ignore the necessity of profits. Yeah, they do. They ignore the necessity of profits, or more, more accurately, as he goes on to say, to overestimate their average or total net amount, to denounce unusual profits anywhere, to tax them excessively, and sometimes even to deplore the very existence of profits. Again, Smith's lesson teaches us that profits are nothing more than a measure of how productive an exchange has been for both parties. How much, how much gain is, is gained from both parties. You wouldn't buy the candy bar at the gas station if you, didn't, if you didn't prefer that candy bar to the amount of money you were exchanging for it. And the purveyor, the seller, would not have sold you that candy bar if they didn't value the, the dollars that you're giving them more than, than they value the candy bar. By the way, subjective theory of value, um, which rebukes, of course, the objective theory of value ex expo espoused by Marx and um, Engels. All of these complaints, by the way, too, all of these grievances on page 207 to 209, I mean... Uh, they still make efforts to quote unquote stabilize special commodity prices. I, I don't even have notes on this. I'm, I'm actually not. I'm just pulling out random excerpts. Uh, they continue to pass laws granting special privileges and immunity to labor unions to oblige workers to become members, to tolerate mass picketing and other forms of coercion, and to compel employers to quote unquote bargain collectively in good faith with such unions, i.e., to make at least some concessions to their demands. The intention of these all measures is to quote unquote help labor, but the result is once more to create and prolong unemployment and total wage payments compared with what they might have been. I, I, I mean, all of these grievances that he's complaining against, complaining against, to pile one more item on this seat, let us talk about the recent tendency, not only to stay for, hard, for every social program once launched upon to get completely out of hand. All of the things that he's complaining about, all of his grievances, all of the things that he's arguing against could, could just be excerpts of AOC TikTok rants. Uh, I mean... Again, if any of this sounds familiar, let me know, right? Most of them still make full employment their overriding goal. They can continue to import, um, import. They continue to impose import quotas and protective tariffs. They try to increase exports by depreciating their currencies even further. Firm farmers are striking for parity prices. 
again, it, this sounds like it could come from any one of the mouths of any of the now openly communist politicians and pundits right here on YouTube. And again, I'm not using the word communist to, uh, to disparage their character, or to disparage their name, though I could. That's how they describe themselves. Uh, Keynesian economics has, uh, uh, as he has described, completely consumed the economic and political worlds. And uh, continuing on this trend of, does this sound familiar, on page 204, one of the, excuse me, uh, a great number of our politicians are still unceasingly recommending more deficit spending in order to cure or to reduce existing unemployment. It's 2021. What does that sound like? Uh, again, on page 204. All this has been accompanied by an enormous increase in the stock of money from $113 billion of, in, if he gives the numbers. In other words, the active money supply has been more than tripled in that period that he talked about from 40 years ago. He goes on. The effect of this increase in money has been a dramatic increase in prices. Again, it's December 2021. Does any of this sound familiar? The Consumer Price Index stood at, uh, in 1946 at 58.5. In September 1978, it was 199.3. Prices, in short, more than tripled. Who can relate to this today? Does any of this sound familiar? So, again, and the numbers that he cites when it comes to inflation, I, if, you, if only you could see this, see inflation now, Hazlitt. Like, if only if you could see the supply of money today relative to two years ago. Relative to two years ago today, um, and, sp and he spent a great deal of time in this, in this chapter on inflation. What I would actually recommend for people who still don't get inflation is, is to uh, book one of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations is basically nothing more than a history of, well, it includes a huge, as a huge part of its content, the history of currency and how currency, even when it's, we're talking about the copper standard or the silver standard, or the gold standard, how that got deflated by uh, mixing in other, uh, mixing in impurities, mixing in less valuable metals, right? And what you mix in cheap metals to, to gold and silver coin. And what winds up happening is not only do you, you degrade the value of the coin because the coin is just simply a, 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 a cylinder with a stamp on it from somebody that says, you can trust us. This has our stamp on it, so it represents X amount of gold. Well, if you mix in chemical, uh, other, other metals, then it no longer represents that amount of gold. And what you're concerned with is the amount of gold. Currency is nothing more than a medium of an exchange. I've said it a million times if I've said it even once. That what that coin represents is the amount of gold in it, which means two things. One, that gold is nothing more than a stand-in for the thing for which it exchanges, which means if I am X level of productive, if I suddenly have more of these coins, they're only going to represent that X amount of productivity, which means that no matter how much coin is in circulation, I'm only going to be able to exchange that, uh, that amount of productivity for whatever that amount of productivity will actually fetch in a free market. Again, assuming that you have the ability to consent, uh, you don't have. You have a government which allow a political environment, let's say, that allows for mutually consensual transactions to take place. The existence of currency is purely utilitarian. It is a means to an end, and nothing else. If currency isn't useful for serving that end, if it isn't useful as a medium for exchange, it will disappear. It will lose its value very quickly and come off the market, which means that if you can no longer trust the stamp, this is the second part of this, when you see that stamp, your trust is what is in that stamp. You're trusting that stamp to represent a certain amount of gold so that you don't have to carry around a scale and a, uh, uh, you know, and, and, a, and a flask, a graduated cylinder, excuse me, so you can determine the, the exact volume of the coin and the exact mass of the coin and thus determine the amount of gold that's in it, right? Because you can determine its density. Excuse me. Which is how you determine the gold standard. When you degrade that trust, 
then you degrade the value of the stamp on the coin, which means that the coin itself has essentially no value. You lose faith in that coin. You lose trust in that coin. By the way, the word trust actually has a similar um, etymology with trust funds, right? Like if you're going to establish something in, in a trust, then you're doing basically, there's, a, there's an overlap in, in the etymology of those words. Um, how much you trust the currency, how much you trust um, the stamp on that currency. So again, if you, if, you're, if you still aren't getting the inflation thing, I highly recommend book one from The Wealth of Nations. In fact, if you're going to read any book in The Wealth of Nations, it is, I think, the longest book, but it's the most important one because it goes over that history of currency, which makes it just really clear what's going on when you just print money indefinitely. And by the way, this goes against the natural tendency of prices, which I've gone over a million times. The natural tendency of prices for prices, the natural tendency of prices is for them to go down over time. Not in real terms, but in nominal terms. If you don't have this interference, if you, if you're allowed to engage infinitely in mutually consensual transactions. And the goal of government is just to simply maximize that mutual consent and those transactions. Then what will happen is prices will tend to go down. I talked about this on my series and interference. I'll put a link to that series in this video's description. But the the most obvious examples are, are markets where you have almost no regulation. Let's say like cathode ray TVs. How much did the world's best cathode ray TV uh, fetch in 1990? kind of a lot of money. And how much was that that thing worth in just in nominal dollars? Right? It, maybe it was a uh, you know, a $500 TV in 1990, or maybe it was a $1000 TV in 1990. How much is that cathode ray TV fetch today? The best cathode ray TV you can get your hands on. If you're if you're playing melee, maybe 20 bucks. Maybe 20 bucks. If you're not playing melee, you got to pay somebody to take that off your hands. It has negative value. It has a negative price at market. Same thing with laser vision correction. Laser vision correction is a part of as a part of healthcare, if you want to call it that. That is an extremely unregulated market, and when it first came into existence, it was tens of thousands of dollars per eye, and now you can get it done for like five thousand dollars or less for both eyes, and it's gotten more effective and it's gotten better, and it's gotten more secure and more safe, and it's gotten quicker, and it's more ubiquitous extremely unregulated market. All you have government dare to do is to ensure mutually trans- consensual transactions. So I talked about this on my show on my other channel earlier uh, last week. Um, and the question I was asking throughout the course of that, that show was, what is the proper role of government? So uh, I guess I'll put a link to that video in this, in this video's description. It focuses on my town. But it, the, the question here. It's an important question to ask. What is the proper role of government? And when it comes to economics, there's the general question, what should proper, what is the proper role of government? What is the the thing that government should be doing? Um, uh, Page 203. Ooh, ooh, oh, all right. Am I going to bother to read that? Um, No, that's all right. So, so So what is the proper role of government? Hazlitt actually answers that when it comes to the proper role of government in economics. Um, on page 211 with what I think is the single best line in the whole book. I'll, I'll, read, um, I'll read a few lines, and it's the final line that's the really, that's, that drives the, the point home. It is the proper sphere of government to create and enforce a framework of law that prohibits force and fraud, but it must refrain from specific economic interventions. Government's main economic function is to encourage and preserve a free market. I want to say that again. Government's main economic function is to encourage and preserve a free market. Based Henry Hazlitt. So again, I talked about this in my series on interference. A free market is not a market which has no government. It's actually a market that that necessitates government. A free market is one which is free from interference. What do I mean by interference? Interference with mutually consensual transactions. So interference doesn't have to be from government, but it can't, but that's today where it's, it's the primary originator of interference is government. 
um, criminal activity, what we would consider today to be criminal activity. If there were no, no government, it wouldn't technically be criminal, but those type of activities, stealing, um, beating somebody up for their goods and services rather than actually engaging in a mutually consensual transaction. He's implying here that the role of government is to ensure mutual constraint, consent in all transactions. And that's it. That's the only thing that he's supposed to do. Uh, with the epithet uh, from Diogenes, uh, uh, when Alexander the Great visited the philosopher Diogenes and asked whether he could do anything for him, Diogenes is said to have replied, quote, yes, stand a little less between me and the sun, end quote. And <clears throat> he's a thousand percent right. If you want to see economic prosperity in a country, and in fact, this is a pretty good heuristic guideline to be used for really any governmental policy, when it, especially as it relates to economics. Where is the mutual consent? How are we restoring mutual consent in transactions? There are, this, by the way, this isn't an argument. The role for government isn't zero. This isn't an, an argument for anarchism. Um, in fact, every, you're probably going to hear the straw man version of what he just said in that, you know, the, in that single line that, you know, basically the role of government is to ensure mutual consent in transactions. You're going to hear the straw man version of that, which is that there is no role for government and that it's just anarchy. Uh, speaking of straw man, you're also going to hear, uh, you, there's uh, this chapter could have uh, the straw man that Hazlitt and free marketeers are against the mere existence of unions, which is just not true. Uh, you may, you may, you may misinterpret that from what he said on page 204. One of the worst results of the retention of the Keynesian myths is that it not only promotes greater and greater inflation, but that it systematically diverts attention from the real causes of our unemployment, such as excessive union wage rates, which isn't an argument against unions, it's against an argument against the policies that allow for the excessive union, union wage rates, um, which... Um, uh, which include all the, the grievances that he brings up in pages 207 to, p to page 209. <clears throat> so no, Hazlitt is not against unions, but he is a, totally against being coerced by government to uh, join the unions or to be coerced by government as an employer to negotiate with unions or to be coerced by government to uh, and act or respond in a certain manner to, to unions. If people want to form unions, they can collectivize their bargaining units and one of the ways that you can negotiate better salaries to raise uh, wage rates that are too low is to unionize. Of course, in a free market, if the wage rates are have if the pendulum has swung the other way and the wage rates are way too high because of union protections, then you'll just see scabs come in. You'll see the, the employer say, "Yeah, you know what? Go take a hike. I dare you. I dare you to leave." And then he'll find he'll find somebody to take your to your place at that either existing wage rate or the lower wage rate. By contrast, of course, if the wage rate is too low, if it's below the market value, then he won't be able to find sufficient labor to replace that labor that says, screw it, we're on strike. So so you're gonna hear this argument get straw man. It is not an argument against the mere existence of unions. So the last thing I want to do, since this is the last chapter in the book, is provide a little bit of a review, not only of this chapter, but of the book in general very briefly. Um there's some places here in this chapter where I disagree real quick on page 210. Uh, no one can say today whether Social Security is really an insurance program or just a complicated and lopsided relief system. Black pill, it's neither, than though, it's neither of those. It's a pyramid scheme. Uh, and speaking of black pills, we're going to close the book on a bit of a black pill. I cannot agree with Hazlitt's optimism on page 211. The outlook is dark, but it is not entirely without hope. Here and there, one can detect a break in the clouds. More and more people are becoming aware that government has nothing to give them without first taking it away from somebody else or from themselves. Kind of don't think that's the case today. Increased handouts to selected groups mean merely increased taxes or increased deficits and increased inflation, and inflation in the end misdirects and disorganizes production. Even a few politicians are beginning to recognize this, and some of them even state it clearly. That would be Thomas Massey and basically nobody else today. In addition, there are marked signs of a shift in intellectual winds of, the, of doctrine. True, but it's not going to be in the direction that he says in, is true of 1978. Keynesian and New Dealers seem to be in a slow retreat. 
exact opposite is going on today. Conservative, conservatives, libertarians, and other defenders of free enterprise are becoming more outspoken and more articulate, kind of, and there are, kind of true, um, and there are many more of them. In absolute terms, maybe in percentage terms, no. Among the young, there is a rapid growth of a disciplined school of Austrian economics. Actually, Zoomers are full-on communists. We thought initially... Uh, when they were, say, middle school and high school age, that they were going to be the most conservative generation since the greatest generation, the generation of the Depression, <clears throat> uh, you know, that fought in World War II. It's the exact opposite. These the, Most Zoomers are proving to be full-on Vossian-level communists. Um, so uh, I'm just reviewing my notes here. Yeah, the exact opposite has taken place. He might have been, Hazlitt might have been right in 1978, but man, I wish I, wish I could get him in a DeLorean and so, he can, so he can see... Um, what it looks like today. And in fairness, in the 1970s, the reason I think that was the case is because in the 1970s, we had the Soviet Union. We we could just point to the Soviet Union and say, look, th those are the bad guys right there. And you can see how awful things are in the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> the Gulag Archipelago had just started to come, come across the pond and had made it into relative mainstream by the time, uh, by the time 1978 had come around. We haven't had that in 30 years. We haven't had a Soviet Union to point to in 30 years, which means there's a whole generation that's grown up without that and are now full-on Maoist, Leninist, and now full-on Maoist, Maoist and Leninist communism is out in the open. There are at least six congressmen, sitting congressmen right now, who are Democrats in name only because what they would be if they could get elected under that ticket is just full-on socialists or communists. And the only reason Bernie Sanders, as I get a little bit political here, has dropped the moniker of socialist and has kind of covered it up with with the obfuscation, which is de democratic socialism, um, a democratic socialist, <clears throat> excuse me, is, become, is because it's become politically unpalatable to have the word socialist in, in your title, in, in how you describe your politic. So I hate to leave things on that bit of a black pill, but I mean, unfortunately, I think uh, the reason I consider this to be such an important read in economics is because we are especially today at a point where the, even the most basic obvious statements of, of fact, even the things that are out there in front of you, so many people just openly are in denial of and just openly reject. And I said when I first reviewed this that for me, I got to about chapter four or five, maybe six, and was like, okay, you're beating a dead horse here. And he kind of is because it is economics in one lesson. And for me, the lesson's really obvious and I kind of didn't even need it by the time I got to this book. Um, but I think that it takes this level of pedantics to reach those who are just, again, in complete rejection of the things that are obviously true and are so obviously true they, they must be just revealing themselves in plain sight. Um, so that's, that's why I think this book is so important, why I've, I've kind of focused on it as, as a great introduction um, into the world of economics. Now, with that said, the last thing we are going, this actually concludes the book. So if you want to, if you want to end the series here, you can. There's going to be one more read in this series, and I don't, I don't know when I'm going to have time to get to it. It's only two pages long, and it is a note on books. And the short version is um, that he's going to go over, uh, it's basically just a listing of the books that he thinks, after you finished his, of course, uh, that you should you should read to further your uh, venture into economics and to use his as an as an introduction. Just in review and summation, real quick, I think the best book if you're just starting to get into economics is Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies. Everyone who's a fan of Sowell tends to go to basic economics. I think that's actually too much, and this is significantly more digestible and actually answers a lot of the questions that I think most people have when it comes to economics <clears throat> and debunks a lot of really uh, pervasive myths. And uh, yeah, I mean, just to spoil it, just to spoil the read, since for those who aren't going to stick around for it, basically what, what, uh, what Hazlitt is going to do with a note on books is say, work your way chronologically backwards. Start with um, the more recent stuff and work your way backward to Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. Again, I'll have to put a link in this video's description to that series. Uh, so you guys can check that out. Um, so like somebody like Sol, where you have incredibly brief, very digestible modern English reads in plain English, 
uh, yeah, start with that stuff, work your way backwards towards, um, you know, towards Friedman, towards Hazlitt, and then towards Hayek. And maybe before that you get into, um, to, to the 19th century, uh, Chicago school or late Austrian school. And then to save books like the wealth of nations pretty much for last. Uh, and I kind of actually agree with that because I mean, it's an absolute tome. It took me two years to read, and it is not an easy read. So um, that's been it for tonight. Like I said, we will continue in this series with his final section. It's only about two pages, which is a note on books. Um, for everyone who is just going to bail now, fa- that's great. That's wonderful. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for sticking with, with me throughout the course of this series. It's been a fun ride. We will see you in the next one, and until then, it's been Mike signing off.